are not put on this earth to avoid danger. And Noah must come very near to extreme danger if he is to reach the new beginning after the flood. God is a God of rules and organization, but with such comes a great cost. Those on the ark are tasked with enduring intense danger and continuing the covenant that God has with creation after the flood. This is no easy task, and is something which is going to require the occupants of the ark to endure an intense amount of danger, and they have to come very near, quite literally, to destruction. Welcome to Kingdom of the Logos, a Christian program of critical thinking and adventure produced by clergy in the Church of the Nazarene. I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor, and here with me in the studio is... Pastor Anthony Alegria. And if we had a lot more sounds in our mix soundboard over there, we would have had some cute doomsday music to go with this idea of intense destruction, because this is actually where Noah is. He is quite literally very close to the deadly force of the floods. He is only separated from these grave forces by the integrity of his vessel, which has been built by the instruction and command of God. And that's a really interesting thing. We're going to have more of Genesis where we're looking at the morality built in. But with you, when you come to the story of Noah and you think about the flood, literally, there is this deadly water which is coming to, to blot out all life from earth except for those on the ark. And there's not much separating them from these waters. It is quite literally just a few things there. But God calls us to live life by rules which he gives us. And the rules of God, they give us stability for eternity. They often bring us very near to dangerous and intense forces, though they also will give us the preparation to endure them, though that is not an easy thing. You see, when you come to Noah, you have to remember that really the world is already doomed by sin. This is an important piece of the context of the story of Noah. All of the hearts and minds of humanity... They are only thinking of sin. And there's this hint there in chapter 6 that they are continually thinking of wickedness. Thus, there's not even an inkling in their mind of anything other than sin and wickedness. And as we know, Anthony, what is the consequence of sin? Well, the wages are death. Yes, the consequences of sin are death. And is it a quick death? No, it is one of, um, I guess, exponential half-lives and decay. Yeah, generally, the consequence of sin is not just a, a nice, well, oh, you sin, snap, you fall on the floor and die. The consequences of sin and the wages of sin that are death, they are a long decay, which increases over time. It's more and more rotting and separation from God. It's a bad thing. And here in the story of Noah, when you get in Genesis 6, that is what we find, that the world is in this place where nothing else is going on but this perpetual bend towards sin and it has come to spill over from humanity to taint all of creation. Now, another aspect of the flood, of course, is the waters. Waters throughout biblical tradition and other ancient traditions have always been a symbol of chaos and suffering. You can find this a lot of different places. They are mysterious, waters are for starters. And even throughout scripture, you find a lot of off-putting tones associated with water. Eventually, in the New Testament, we'll see Jesus walk on water, showing that he is able to have power and authority over the storms of life. If you go all the way back to Genesis 1, you find that even the void is depicted as chaotic waters. Sea monsters like the ones in Jonah or perhaps even the book of Revelation, they are also depicted in Scripture. Water carries a lot of unknowns in it. There's a lot of mysteries, and some of them are more playful, like the mystery of the Loch Ness Monster, and some of them are more serious, like what could be lurking down there to come and rip you away from the world above. Waters are something quite fascinating, and they've always had a lot of mystery with them in the ancient world. In the story of Noah, we find yet again that water is symbolic of something destructive, and of course that is sin. The sin that is rising up, well, also sin is coming to consume, just as floodwaters might. There's a lot of things lurking beneath the surface of sin, just as there might be with the floodwaters. Now, there is quite literally a flood that Noah has to endure, but he also is enduring a world which is surrounded by such floods of sin that they have come and they have corrupted everything. Water is the means of cleansing the world. This is fascinating because if water is always depicted as being something dangerous, mysterious, and even something off-putting, how could it also be that it has such a good use, that it's something which is life-giving and it is, well, it's a cleansing agent? This ongoing storm, which will happen, it is also positioned near in time to this new era of God's covenant. God will not allow such events to take place on the earth, and again, after the flood, but prior to the flood, God is reasserting order on creation, and he's doing this by bringing a great moment of intensity. There's a lot of danger associated here with the water, and let's get into the text and read what we have. Anthony, would you start for us in Genesis chapter 7 and begin in verse 1? Sorry about that. Oh, okay. 
this is a little bit mislabeled, but in any case, Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and its mate, and the pair of animals that are not clean, the male and its mate. The seven pairs of the birds of the air also, male and female, to keep their kind alive on all the face of the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, for forty days and forty nights. And every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord co had commanded him. One of the things I always find fascinating is that with the clean animals, they're commanded to bring seven pairs. And this is also true for the birds. Anthony, is that a detail you've ever paid much attention to? Um, I did notice it before, mostly just because this is such like a huge story. And we're always told that Noah brought two of every animal. But then, yeah. you know, I was reading through this one night and I was like, whoa, shoot. There were seven of the clean, only a pair of the clean. Yeah. And so it really doesn't make a huge difference for me in the story and the interpretation, but it is an interesting thing. Yeah, it is an interesting thing. The unclean animals only get a single pair, but the clean animals, they get seven pair. That actually is something which I think does deserve some attention. We'll get there in a second, but let's talk a little bit about the flood and the chaos because there's a temptation to say that the flood, these waters that are coming, that they look a lot like the chaos and the, the void there in Genesis 1. And, you know, aesthetically, there is some similarity. And some people may argue, well, it's just a repetition. God is starting over. He's giving everything a, a clean start totally from scratch. This is not quite true. God has rules for this flood. And even within this little bit of scripture that we've read so far, we can find that it's only going to last so long. And also God has made an ark. So he's not actually starting from scratch. Humanity and the animals don't really have any change. They're not coming out of this looking like some crazy HP Lovecraft monster where they've all been ripped inside out and stapled back together with some sort of crude monstrous structure. But instead, they're going to come out generally the same. Um, in fact, they physically are going to be the same. That's kind of the point of the ark is that they're not going to be changed. And even Noah and the animals, they have memories of life before. But the things which will change within them is they're no longer in an environment that is this perpetual bend towards sin. And the covenant that God has with his creation is going to be asserted in a little bit more strict way. There's going to be more rules. The animals and the people may be the same physically, but the relationship with God is going to be a bit different. God's commitment to the world is going to endure, but it will have a few more rules for creation after this. Anyways, let's get back to talk about these animals, because that really is, you know, an exciting thing. We all like animals. Anthony, you like animals? Oh, yeah, they're the best. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the tests I have when people, they come and they say, you know, I'm interested in ministry. I'm always like, well, how do you treat dogs? You know, that's, that's a good test for people. Animals are interesting and they're a lot of fun. Dogs, of course, are the best companion that man can have, though a dog can be bad, too. They are agents of will, the, lacking the integrity and rationality that humanity does. They're at a different place in creation, but all the same. You know, we find that God has purpose for animals. Um, and like a dog can be a friend, yet it's lower in the hierarchy than, than man is. When we look at the story of Noah, we see once again that God, he does have purpose for different things. I actually think it's pretty interesting that God tells Noah to bring seven pairs of the clean animals because this is indicating to us that God is going to do something with them. They need to be more in supply than just perhaps, say, something which is unclean, something that's just going to repopulate and maybe its species is going to do its own thing over there. But here we find that God is planning to do something. Again, clean animals, they are associated with offerings, with sacrifices. You know, there are certain animals which are unclean that one does not eat, and there are animals which are clean to eat. These animals, which are brought in seven pairs, they are animals which have a plan. And again, this is reminding us that God is a God of organization. He's thought this out. He's planned it out and realized that some animals are going to be more in demand and others are not. And thus the supply and demand of animals on the ark, it is important to consider that when putting them on there. The rules and expectations, and these rules and expectations, they will increase after the flood. Many times our world, they want to say, oh, look at like the primitive state where, where people don't have a lot of things, as if back in the Stone Age or sometime where people don't have advanced tools and things, they would actually be more moral. One of the things which is interesting is people tend to look back in time and think that simplicity often increases morality. But if we actually listen to the wisdom of history, 
Well, it'll tell us that how much technology you have around you, where you're at in time, has little to do with how moral you are. The proclivity and bend towards sin can affect anybody anywhere, no matter how much tooling they have, no matter how primitive they are, how advanced they think they are. The one thing that does affect people's tendency towards sin is how well they can listen to wisdom and the rules of God. And that's a really fascinating thing. God looked at his world. It was very simple, but in a lot of rules. And even when you look at the covenant God has with creation, it's largely implied. He does have some specific things. He says, you know, don't eat this fruit, you know, have dominion over the earth, be fruitful, multiply, things of that nature. But then there are some implied things like I created you. I didn't consult you if you wanted to be created, but you need to be loyal to life. You're going to be my servant. There are a lot of things which are implied with God's covenant with creation. But after the flood, they're going to be a bit more strictly outlined. And this is something we will find continuing on for quite a while. Eventually, the Jewish people will have a well-developed code. And as God's holiness is revealed to the people around him, God's rules and things are also clearly outlined. One of the great misfortunes leading up to the flood is that the line between heaven and earth are blurred. It is blurred. The lines which would separate the two, the rules for heaven, the rules for earth, they are very much blurred. And God looks at it and says it's not good. And that, of course, is not good. And that's where we find the flood coming. God is sorry for all that it has come to, and now the flood is here. Anthony, would you pick up reading in Scripture? This is picking up in verse 6 of chapter 7. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of, when the flood of waters came on the earth. And Noah, with his sons and his wife, his sons' wives, went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of clean animals, and of animals that are not clean, and of birds, and everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah, as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the water of the flood came on the earth. All right, danger is here. The people and the animals that are to enter the ark, they are preparing for an oncoming storm. There's a flood that's just around the corner. Life after the flood will not be as primitive as life before. It will have more rules and barriers. But in order for them to get to this new era, they must endure a great amount of danger. You know, the opening statement I had in this was, we were not put on this earth to avoid danger. We're not meant to be idle. We're not meant to sit by. And many times we're taught by the secular world the sentiment that says, you know, if you just don't offend anyone, if you don't go anywhere near danger, then peace will come. That's actually not true. The biblical understanding is that if you want to get to a place of peace and prosperity, you've got to come extraordinarily near to danger and not just mild danger, but great grave danger, danger that is deadly, that it can swallow you up, that it's swift, that you have no power over it. Anthony. Yeah, there is sort of this idea with that, that the natural state of things is order. Whenever you think that, you know, the best thing to do is not to do anything and then you have peace. You know, that's what a lot of people do believe, and that's what a lot of people are told about. And it is sort of interesting, the philosophy that that takes you to, is that the natural state of things is one of orderliness and peacefulness. But then whenever you look at the creation account, you can see that the natural state of things is not uh, orderliness and peacefulness. It's actually um, chaos and disorder. It is, you know, churning waters. And then there is the Spirit of God hovering over it, and God takes action and then brings order. Well, I mean, even if someone is a non-believer, and if you're looking to evangelize someone, and you're wanting to talk about this, the natural state of the universe, the cosmos, is not order. I mean, even in science, we have laws of entropy. We can look and see that things are decaying. You know, recently there was a, a discovery made about a black hole, and they thinking they might be able to see it. Other people who do memes on the internet think it may look like the taillights on a skyline, GTR. Who knows? But the whole point is, is the law of the land is not one of order. The world is that naturally a very chaotic place. It's a violent place. Even if you look at animal like this, animal life. Yeah, animals are cool. I love to go to the zoo. I love a lot of things. I love cats that are wild cats and seeing predatory cats. They're really cool. But also, if you watch them, they will kill very quickly, brutally. There are a lot of animals on this planet which are absolutely savage. You look at something like a squid. You know, they've got what we oftentimes depict cutely as being suction cups, but really they've got something like a beak. They've got fingernail-like hooks which screw into things. The world is filled with a lot of chaos and disorder. Nature is a place 
which while it can balance itself to an extent, it is also one which has a lot of danger in it. The natural state of things is not peace. And in fact, all the way back to the beginning, and when you get to the biblical accounts, God gives humanity the charge of having dominion over the earth and subduing it because the earth is naturally a place which needs to be subdued. And in order to get to a place of peace, to actually achieve prosperity, you actually have to get pretty close to danger. And again, this is not like a, a superficial danger like one may have in, in a competition that's sort of set up. You know, this is a real battle. It's not something which is staged or choreographed. Noah is actually surrounded by grave danger, but he's protected by the ark, the ark which he built with precise instructions from God, and he's even sealed up inside by God. We'll get to that in a moment. But Noah has to come very close to extreme real danger in order to make it to this new era. And there's something important for us to understand as we read this. Anthony, would you pick up in verse 11 for us? In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month of the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened. The rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Sin is something which is difficult to escape, just as the waters of a flood can be difficult to evade. They spread. They're faster than you can imagine, and they have violent surprises hidden just beneath the surface. Floodwaters are some of the most dangerous features of reality that people can attempt to maneuver. But they're also something which is always appealing, especially for people who are young and are still in adolescence. They have swift currents. They have pools of water where they might normally not have. There's a sense of air and mystery to it. You, there's some cool things going on. But yet, they also collect very quickly. They're actually collecting faster than most waterways can handle them. Hence why they become floods. They're spilling over. They destroy many things in their paths, and they even carry their prey for miles without relent. Sin functions a lot like a flood water. Floodwaters are very dangerous, just as sin can pollute the mind. They disrupt the soul in the same way that flood can disrupt the soil, and it can damage fields. They taint the world indefinitely. Sin can come and taint your mind. It can expose you to things and plant seeds of destruction, just as floodwaters can come. They can modify geographical features. They can tear down human structures. They can do all sorts of things which have hidden consequences, and it happens very quickly. They possess currents that are not always obvious to the eye. I know one of the things, even as I was talking with Anthony, as Anthony come to, to be around me and started working with the church and getting involved here at Kingdom of the Lagos, I know there were several floods which happened here in the last few years, and we were talking about it, but there is a temptation a lot of people have. They see, like, flood water, and they're like, yeah, I really want to go swim in that. I don't know if anything has any thoughts he wants to share on this, but I know there's there's always a lot of young people. It seems, it seems the younger you get, the more you want to do this. They want to go out boating in the flood water and stuff, but... I don't know why. It just It makes sense to swim in the water that's not supposed to be there. But at the same time... Whenever you say it out loud, it's like, oh, wait, no. Yeah, That's like a terrible idea. <laughs> I've always grown up on a farm, and when floods and things come, they'll come and they'll take, like, fence rows down and, and way far away. And you might find, like, a whole ball of, like, barbed wire and stuff that's over there next to where people want to jump in the stuff and swim. You know, they, they wash huge structures. We've even had wagons and stuff wash up on our into to our, our property that are from other people's. There's all sorts of huge metal things that get washed down the the floodwaters and people, they want to jump into this stuff. And, you know, that's like crazy dangerous. I've, I've known people killed from this sort of thing. It's, it's really a, a risky thing to do because you have no idea what's below there. And, and plus, it's not easy to gauge how quickly the water is moving. So there's danger to face to bring order. And then there's danger, which is to be avoided. Yes. Yeah. And that's the thing. It, it takes some discretion here. Humanity and its many members living across time and throughout various locations of the earth they were the piece of creation which were given the charge of subduing the earth. They had a specific goal given to them. And the state of, of the earth is naturally filled with a lot of different dangers. Sort of like Anthony said, you know, there's sometimes you have to have discretion, you know, avoid that danger. Other times you've actually got to get close to it if you actually want to rise above and get somewhere. Now, again, this isn't saying going out and finding danger for danger's sake. There are actually rules and there are reasons why one would go towards danger. And here in the story of Noah, God has a specific reason for this. He's got an ark and it is going to carry people through to survive to a new day. 
The covenant of God is also going to be on this ark, and that's a fascinating thing. Now, it's not the ark of the covenant, but it is one which endures God's covenant with humanity. That's very, very fascinating. Well, we're going to go ahead and start wrapping this up. But the main takeaway I want people to have from this is that floods, they are unexpected. Oftentimes we see cities being caught off guard whenever a flood starts to, to gather. People, as they, they go near floods and things of that nature, they rarely find that they're prepared for this. Similarly, people also find that they're rarely prepared for sin. But yet they creep in on us and they bring a lot of destruction, especially if we're not prepared for them. In the story of Noah, as we see the rain fall, and it falls for 40 days, one of the interesting details that I want to bring up that's in verse 16, and I'll just read verse 16 for us, is that the Lord shuts them in. Let me read this verse, and I want you to hear this final statement in there. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded them, and the Lord shut him in. So what's happening here is that God shuts in those on the ark. He seals up Noah. God cares greatly for his creation. God is aware that this is serious danger. It's not something to, to sneer at. God also realizes that things like sin, they are extreme real danger. God has a well-planned, organized plan for us and the other aspects of creation that he'll carry it out. But we have to be willing to listen to some wisdom. We have to be able to subdue even our own will to do things which are destructive. If one did not have obvious instruction from God to build an ark, it may not be apparent to them that a storm of such magnitude was a few moments away. The instruction of God gave insight on how to survive an unexpected storm. One does not have to live through certain events in order to appreciate the wisdom and warnings against them. One does not have to have lived through great tragedy to hear wisdom that says this is how you avoid great tragedy. And we do well to heed wisdom prior to such events rather than after. When life sends floods our way, it is much better that we are proactive in preparing our souls for such dangerous routes. Because, as stated earlier, we were not put on this earth to avoid danger. And if we can carefully organize ourselves with the wisdom of God, then we will be primed to endure great challenges, even those which are deadly and violent. Well, that's where we're going to wrap this up. So if you have any thoughts, questions, or comments about the story of Noah, or maybe you have some confrontation you want to share with us because that is the internet and people do that. We are called to live in danger. Send us your thoughts, questions, and comments. And it's not danger for danger's sake, but sometimes in order to get good places, you've got to, you've got to be in danger. But you've got to follow the rules of God. Anthony, do you have any final thoughts before we close? Um, yeah, I hope this, isn't, this won't take too long, but later on in the wandering... For 40 years in the desert we see the people of god being consumed by fear of their enemies and things of that nature and lacking faith for god and only two from that generation were selected to go into the promised land you see joshua and then you see caleb and it's written they're the only two because they were the only two who remained faithful whenever um they were supposed to go spy out their enemies in the promised land and so they were the only two who were allowed into the promised land Later on, you see things like the exile, where a faithless generation is brought out into Babylon and the rest of um, what would later be the Persian Empire and brought out of the Promised Land. Generations later, 70 years later, being allowed to return back with a much greater and strengthened faith. Would you say that there's any connection between these two stories and the flood here with Noah? I would, and it's not a pretty one that a lot of people want to hear. Sometimes cultures, sometimes things get so bad that they have to die off. That the transformation that happens is on a new day. That it's after a new beginning where something has endured. You know, a lot of people romanticize the exile moments and times of that. They say, oh, we're in exile. And people kind of think it's trendy and it kind of lets them alleviate the suffering they have. People use it as a bit of a crutch and an excuse. But realistically, there are times where God says, no, it's so bad that I'm going to let it die. And there will be a new generation after that. And usually the people who make up that generation afterwards are pretty hardcore, intense people. Um, who have a really strong moral compass. I love the exile text where you find people like Nehemiah and Esther, people who realistically like nowhere would ever be qualified to do some of the things they pull off. And even you look at, at others, there are the, some prophets like Zechariah and Haggai. They're much older in years. They're not 
really in a world where you would expect such things to happen. And they come out and say, you know what? God has blessed us. We have been slaves. We have been servants. We have been taken away as captives. But now we have an opportunity for a new era. And that opportunity we are graced with requires manual labor and hard work. It doesn't require sitting around and wallowing in pity. We are thankful to God for the ability to do difficult and hard things, and we go out and do them. And it's usually the people like that that say we're grateful for an opportunity to do difficult things. They're the ones that usher in these new generations. You look at someone like when they go into the promised land, you get Joshua, the whole series of events there. You even look at some of the judges. You go up towards Haggai, Zechariah. You look at the, the high priest who's also named Joshua, who's building the temple. You look at people like Nehemiah. You look at people like Esther. They're people who are putting on super massive responsibility and basically have a humble attitude about it, saying, you know what? I'm grateful that I'm put in this awful position to do hard work. Um, praise be to God. Let's do it. Anyways, I hope that answered that question that Anthony threw at me. Um, that's not the answer that people want. People always want the answer that says, oh, I'm in a place of, of sorrow and now a pie of gold comes from heaven for me. But realistically, that's, that's not the case. Ugh. Any final thoughts? Anthony is good. His mouth is sealed. Yep. I'm good. All right. Well, with that, praise be to God. I hope everyone out there has a blessed day.